Hey folks, welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk a little more about learning environments and um, learning theories. And in this one, I'm going to be talking a bit about my own example for my own teaching practice. So for your online activity in this module, I asked you to design a learning environment based on the learning theory of your choosing. And for my own little exemplar, I have decided to redesign the last classroom I got to teach in person pre-pandemic um, from a complexity science standpoint. So I'm going to show you what the classroom looked like when I got it how I worked with it to make it a little more aligned with my own philosophy of teaching and learning, and then give you an idea of what I would do if it was more of a um, set classroom that was regularly assigned to me, and if you Ottawa would let me do renovations, which they wouldn't, but a girl can dream. <laughs> uh, so some pieces of this, this will be very driven by theory and complexity science, and some were just driven by my own lived experiences as a learner and as an educator. So for a little bit of context here, the course that we're talking about here is one from first year first semester of the BEd program at UOttawa. It's for all adult learners and I believe my section was mostly intermediate and um, senior prospective teachers so grades um, 7 to 12 for those of you who aren't in Ontario. I think I also had a few that want to teach junior and intermediate um, with junior going as low as grade 4 I believe. Um, I don't think I had anyone in the primary division in my class. And my learners came from a wide variety of backgrounds and they were a variety of different ages. So I had some who had gone straight through and were just coming from undergrad. And a few had graduate degrees already. And for a few others, this was a second career later in life. Um, I also had a few international students and quite a few were from provinces outside of Ontario. So it was a very diverse group. Um, and there were a lot of different teachables or subject areas that my learners wanted to teach in my class because it was a course that everyone took. Um, so I had prospective music teachers, health and physical education teachers, English, history, art, etc. And I've done a quick mock-up here of what the classroom that I was assigned to looked like. Um, I take an actual picture for you, but I have not been on campus in over a year. So my classroom had three long rows of tables that sat about two to three people per table, depending on how cozy they wanted to get. And up at the front, they had a little podium for the computer. And it was up against the wall, which meant I really couldn't read my notes while I was presenting to the class, or I would have to turn my back to the class if I were to use the computer that they provided. So it wasn't the most convenient. Um, behind me, there was also a smart board on the left there, um, a projector screen off to the right. We look over to the other wall on the side here. I had a big chalkboard as well, uh, which we did use sometimes actually. And if we switch views here, you can see um, at the back of the classroom, there were a few windows and there were two um, TV screens that showed me my slides while I was presenting. Um, still couldn't see any of my notes and they were too far away for someone with glasses like me to be able to read my slides. So for me, they were more so kind of roughly confirming if I was on the right slide, um, but otherwise for me, at least they were kind of useless. Um, I also, when I am presenting, especially um, synchronously, I like to be able to see my presenter notes. I usually don't use them, but as someone with anxiety, I feel a lot better knowing that they're there if I need them. And this particular physical space wouldn't allow for that because I couldn't move the little podium slash computer stand. Either it was very heavy or more likely it was bolted down. Um, so for me, there was a little bit of an accessibility issue here as an educator. Um, I think there may have also been a chalkboard on this back wall there too. This really wasn't accessible to me as the instructor because there was tables in front of it, there was usually chairs piled in front of it, so we usually used the one that was closer to the projector screen. And so how I laid out my classroom for each of my classes really depended what we were doing on that day. Usually I had my learners in groups like this, and you can justify this arrangement from so many different theoretical standpoints. I mean, even just looking at our reading this week, I mean, cognitivism looks much like this. Constructivism looks much like this. Communities of practice would also absolutely consider a layout like this. However, I did it from a complexity science standpoint because I believe that learning emerges from interactions between agents in a system. So as a teacher, I believe that my learners need to interact and bump up against one another's ideas as part of the learning process. And this idea ties in nicely with the concept of neighboring interactions that we talked about in our previous model on complexity science. Something else I consider with my groups when I'm grouping like this in my physical classroom is I consider diversity and redundancy. So as I mentioned in our previous module, I never put my groups together alphabetically. Um, I also tend to not do it randomly either. I'm always trying to consider diversity and redundancy when I put my groups together. So as an example of this and how I've actually done this physically in my classroom is um, when the class was reading Little Voice, 
um, as I talked about in our critical pedagogy module. And as one of their assignments, they had to create a unit plan for something that they would actually teach. So for that class, I did place them in groups by their teachables or the subject area that they wanted to teach. And so I made these cute little signs that I put on all the group tables of the different subject areas that people were teaching uh, so they could find one another. So I had phys ed and geography, English, math and science. I got French on here. So yeah, I have French as a second language and I had fine arts as well. So I grouped them together like this so they could find one another and so they could share their unit plans with one another, in addition to just genuinely discussing the novel and their thoughts on it. Um, and so while this was a, quite a bit of redundancy, there was still an incredible amount of diversity in the group just because of how diverse the class was. And they also had all very different unit plans that they were sharing with one another. And I thought about what if I mix them up so there were people from who taught different subject areas in the same groups, but I was worried that that would be far too much um, diversity for a discussion like this. Uh, so for this particular class, I then had them come up with some type of uh, representation of their discussion to share with the class. So to do this, I brought in some general art supplies, which I just grabbed out of my storage unit. So I have my nice big bucket. I've got crayons and pencil crayons and post-it notes, markers, highlighters, Play-Doh. Play-Doh is very, very popular, I have learned, with uh, teacher candidates. I actually had to go out and buy more for them. And then so I got them to create something with what I had brought in to share with the rest of the class in a gallery tour format. So some created mind maps, some drew pictures, um, quite a few did Play-Doh sculptures. And we did a little gallery tour where we went around the class and one or two people from each group shared what they created and talked about how it represented what they had discussed in their group. And unfortunately, there wasn't a whole lot I could do about the whole computer podium slash cabinet issue because it's attached to the ground, I'm pretty sure. And as I mentioned earlier, the, it was, the podium was super inconvenient. I found it the setup to be very inconvenient for me as an educator. And when my learners had to do peer teaching in the latter half of the semester, they also found it very inconvenient for teaching. Um, so a lot of the times I would just bring in my laptop and connect it and just kind of sit it on the front row of, of the, um, the desks and I'd just sit down and talk to the class that way. Now if I could do anything I wanted with this space from a more complexity scientist standpoint, this is what I would probably do with the room. So the first thing I'd want to change is get rid of the tables and have individual desks so there's more options with the room layout depending on what learning outcome we have for that class and what theory I think is appropriate to achieve that learning outcome. And initially I had thought of putting my learners at round tables. Um, it doesn't allow for the type of flexibility I like to have because while I do usually have my learners in groups, uh, sometimes I am doing something that is more individualistic or someone may just want to work uh, more individually. Um, I may be doing something maybe that's a little bit more aligned with cognitivism or um, Piaget's constructivism. And so maybe there could be days where having the more standard rows or columns um, may be more appropriate for what we're doing. Um, a really good example from this is when we're watching, say, a movie in class. Um, I often will start my class in the more standard rows so people aren't sitting at weird angles and kind of you know, cranking their neck trying to see the screen. And then when we go into group discussions, we'll move around the table so it's a more of a group formation. Um, or perhaps some days I may want to do more of a horseshoe formation, like the um, Griffin 2020 article talked about from Module 1 um, and talking about how the horseshoe shape can allow for adult learners um, to have more of a sense of a community atmosphere in the classroom. Uh, here I've also changed up the podium so it faces out. I haven't gone for a traditional desk here because I usually do a flipped classroom approach. And when we're doing the more group activities, I like to be out there rotating amongst the groups and guiding them through with, um, the learning that we're doing in that class. But sometimes I do need to present something or walk my learners through an exemplar. Um, often my learners do some peer teaching or presentation. So it is still good, I think at least, in, have some sort of podium or some sort of table up there with the computer and then looking out at learners so your back isn't to them. I've also added some storage space along the back wall here. Uh, this isn't so much a complexity science uh, informed decision, it's just I usually have big tubs like that with supplies and I usually bring in extra textbooks and things like that and I don't want to lock them back and forth to campus. My back can't take that kind of abuse anymore. Uh, something else I would love, love, love to have in a class would be a couple of meeting rooms. And these could be rooms for groups to work in um, or individual um, and pairs to work in, especially if the room is getting really loud, which it often does when you're doing things more informed by social theories of learning. Really loud rooms can be problematic for most of us, uh, but for someone with a learning exceptionality, it could be even more so. For example, my brother has a central auditory processing disorder. 
So a loud classroom and him go together about as well as oil and water. Um, it could also be difficult for some neurodiverse individuals um, to have a really noisy classroom like that. Uh, I myself need a quiet environment for anything to do with numbers, especially math and counting. Um, so if I hear someone else say a number while I'm counting something, I will lose track of what I'm counting and I have to completely start over. So say in a math class or a stats class, having a quiet place like that for me to work would be quite helpful. So here I'm actually being quite mindful of the bodily and subsystems level if we were to think of it from a nested systems perspective. And for similar reasoning, I've also added in access to the outdoors in my classroom and having a little bit of like a learning and socialization space outside. Um, it's potentially an additional quieter space that learners could go to. And I also just like the idea of having access to the outside because um, complexity science sits on that interobjectivity branch with ecological discourses like eco-psychology, um, so there are some related ideas here. I also consider how we as individuals and classroom collectives are nested in other systems, including our organ systems that comprise us, and then the societies and ecosystems that uh, we comprise ourselves. Uh, so in addition to my learners being able to go outdoors and thinking about learning exceptionalities and how I'm setting up the classroom, there's also some basic needs at this more bodily subsystems level which impact individual learning, for example, food and water. And you can make the argument here for Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, the fact that this is important to me could just be because of my past work as a nurse. Um, but ideally, I would want my learners to have access to water to drink right in the classroom, a place to store food, drink um, during the class, place to make coffee. Coffee is very important. <laughs> and then often to my own classes, I often will actually bring in um, a little electric kettle, tea, instant coffee, things like that. Sometimes food for my learners. And actually, once I have my own physical office, I really want to have a little cabinet um, for my learners, maybe in the hallway or like right inside my door, that's filled with snacks, juices, tea bags, extra pens, menstruation products, things like that that they can come and grab for free if they need them. And at the back of the classroom here, I've added in a couple of computers. Um, at UOttawa, you can rent a variety of different technologies from the university, including laptops, I believe. Um, but ideally, I'd like to have a couple of computer stations in my classroom, uh, for example, maybe someone didn't anticipate they need a laptop that day, their laptop was broken, they just want to quick something, look something up or get on Brightspace. Um, maybe they want to show you their project they've been working on or get some help on APA. Uh, they could also be in a position where they can't afford a computer or a certain software, so this would give them access right in our class. And I think I'll end things off here. Um, these are just a few ideas of how I would apply my philosophy of teaching and learning and more specifically complexity science to my learning environments. I'm sure I could think of way more ideas of how I could bring this into practice, but these are just some of my initial thoughts as I was thinking through this. So what learning theories guide your educational practice, and how does this translate into your classroom space? What barriers might you face when trying to create a learning environment that's influenced by these learning theories? Um, as I mentioned previously, I, in the past I've had to teach in lecture halls where everything is bolted to the ground, which makes it more difficult to try to do group work in class. Uh, so for all of my learners, I look forward to seeing the learning environments that you have created during this module. And as always, I'll see you all online. Bye.